Hello, everyone. My name is Karin Sumes, and I'm the Senior Curator at the Gardner Museum. Welcome to our annual Gardener Lecture Series. Our lecture today is supported by the McDonald Family Foundation, who I would like to thank most sincerely. The annual McDonald Collection Lecture informs interpretation of our unique collection of Japanese porcelain and Japanese-inspired ceramics made in Europe. This collection was donated by Bill McDonald and the late Molly Ann McDonald. You can view some objects on display in the McDonald Gallery at the Gardner Museum. You will notice that your mics and videos are muted and that the chat op option has been disabled. There will be a Q&A function at the end of the lecture, so we invite, we invite you to write in your, uh, your questions at any time during the talk in the Q&A um, in the Q&A box. Please note that the closed captioning provided is automated and that any information provided is not reviewed for accuracy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the Treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Petun, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The community we uh, work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and learn on this land. Today, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Natsu Oyobe as our speaker. Dr. Oriobe is the Curator of Asian Art at the University of Michigan um, Art Museum. She specializes in modern and contemporary Japanese art and has curated numerous um, exhibitions focusing on Japanese art, including our forthcoming exhibition, which will be presented in the fall, entitled Clay as Soft Power, Shigaraki Ware in Postwar America and Japan. Dr. Oriobe served as a consulting curator for the Detroit Institute of Arts New Japan Galleries from 2016 to 2017, and also for the Denver, Denver Art Museum in 2020. Uh, she's now um, working on uh, a forthcoming volume, uh, which will be published in 2023 as both a contributor and co-editor. And the book is entitled Great Waves and Mountains, Collecting the Arts of Japan, and will be published by the University Press of Florida. Today, Dr. Oyobe will be presenting um, a talk entitled uh, Toriawaze, Creating a One and Only Encounter in Japanese Tea Ceremony. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Natsu Oyobe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karin. Uh, thank you so much for a nice introduction. And uh, I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I hope you can see the screen uh, with my first slide. Okay, um, well, thank you again to uh, Karin and the Gardner uh, Museum for inviting me to uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity. And uh, thank you to um, Sama and Richard for supporting uh, this talk. So uh, let's begin. Um, developed in the 16th century Japan, Chanoyu, Japanese tea ceremony, is a practice of making and drinking tea in a carefree prescribed manner. One crucial element of Chanoyu is toriawase, a selection and arrangement of tea utensils according to the season, location, guest, and occasion to create a special moment for the participants. Combining ceramics and other objects of diverse styles and origins from Japan, China, Korea, and elsewhere, a toriawase can be an important um, creative output for tea practitioners. Okay. Chanoyu is now practiced not only in Japan, but also worldwide. In North American major cities, uh, including Toronto, it's quite easy to take chanoyu classes. And powdered tea, tea bowl, and bamboo whisk are sold at uh, ordinary stores. I will use chanoyu instead of the common translation tea ceremony, as ceremony seems to connote to a religious practice. Although there's a great influence from religious practices, especially Zen Buddhism, I want to stress that Chanoyu is a secular practice. Also, I will call the space of Chanoyu tea gathering because of the importance of the person to person relationship.
Toriyawase literally means select, match, and arrange. And in Chanoyu, it is a selection and arrangement of tea utensils in tea gathering. It also extends to the arrangement of the objects in tokonoma, often translated as alcove, or a display area, which is um, considered the most important part of the tea room. The tokonoma display enhances the concept of the tea gathering. So in today's talk, uh, first I will discuss the history of tori awase, introducing tori awase of past and present, and how tea practitioners have created tori awase around their chosen themes and occasions. At the end, I will talk about uh, practice of tori awase during the pandemic period, drawing samples from social media. So um, Japanese cultural historian uh, Murai Yasuhiko said that there are three important components of what separates chanoyu from ordinary tea drinking. The first is a prescribed behavior, um, and the second is the setting or special building, um, tea house, a room for the purpose of tea preparation and drinking. So uh, in this slide, you see on the left, um, a practitioner is uh, cleaning a tea scoop using silk cloth. And on the right side, you see example of uh, a tea house designed by uh, Sen Norikyu, uh, which I, I will describe uh, the person and also a uh, tea house, uh, this tea house later. The third component is toriawase. Uh, Murai defines it as the uh, discrimination of objects that emphasize an aesthetic based on relationships between people and things. So uh, what that means is, uh, while each object may be aesthetically pleasing, more important is that the grouping conveys special meaning, associations, and relationships between people and across time. So in other words, uh, physical qualities such as, such as materials, shapes, colors, and patterns are quite important, but they have to serve to an overarching theme or idea. So uh, what kind of objects are in toriyawase? The short answer is uh, almost everything you see in a tea gathering. So in this slide uh, on the left, you see an iron kettle, a brazier. Uh, so this uh, particular toriyawase is happening in summertime. So it's outside, but uh, in wintertime, like now, uh, there's a sunken hearth um, in inside the tatami mats. There's also a water jar, a tea bowl, a tea scoop, a tea container, uh, and a shelf. Bamboo whisk and a wild, uh, white cloth uh, inside the uh, tea bowl are considered disposable and replaceable. Um, in tokonoma or alcove uh, on the right uh, slide image, there are hanging scroll, uh, mostly uh, calligraphy. There are also flower bases with seasonal flowers. Uh, in this particular one, you see uh, two uh, sets and also incense container. So this is a New Year's um, arrangement, this example is. So you see an incense container in the shape of tiger as uh, this year, year 20, uh, 2022 is the year of tiger. In Chanoyu, there's a concept that the moment of having tea together is only here and now as uh, exemplified in the Zen Buddhist phrase, ichigo ichie, or uh, one time, one meeting. A tea gathering host offers all their knowledge and resources to create this moment for the invited guests. Although the Chinese practice of tea drinking was transmitted to Japan in the ninth century, it was during the 12th to 13th century that Buddhist monks who studied in China brought powdered tea to Japan. By the early 14th century, military elites, aristocrats, and high-ranking Buddhist priests gathered and engaged in tea contests called tocha. They used objects almost entirely imported from China within uh, meeting rooms of, of relatively large buildings. The tea balls shown in the slide are examples of these objects from China. These uh, conical shaped tea balls are called tenmoku chawan or tea balls. There are several types of tenmoku tea balls. 
And this particular type called Yohen Tenmoku has been the most treasured among uh, all the Tenmok tables. Uh, the iron glaze was turned uh, kind of sparkly dots while firing. There are three extant examples in Japan and all national treasure. So uh, there was occasion um, 2020, uh, I believe, that uh, uh, these three walls were uh, ex exhibited in different museums uh, in Japan. So for tea aficionados and ceramic aficionados, <laughs> it was a big, big event. So it was the first time these three um, tea balls were uh, shown in different parts of Japan. The first recorded Japanese instances of the selective use of tea objects occurred in these tea contests. So rather than large numbers of high valued possessions, curated selection of objects were on display. Over the years, uh, meeting rooms began to be equipped with a special display area called uh, tokonoma, combining a writing desk, shelves, and decorative platform. So uh, I want to point out that, that these uh, tea contests, um, uh, the tea was made outside of the rooms uh, by the, uh, the host uh, servants. So it wasn't made you know, inside the room. So in this early 16th century illustration room decoration instruction by collection manager and curator for the shogun, Bun Ami, uh, we can see an example of such a tokonoma display an alcove displaying uh, triptych scrolls, three bronze implements in the middle, and two ceramic bases with assortment of flowers on the right and left. The alcove is flanked by two staggered shelves holding more objects and fl flowers, uh, including lacquer containers, incense implements, and a miniature garden called bonseki. A white Chinese style tea bowl on a black lacquer stand is pictured on the upper left. Uh, so it's right here. Um, so here you see the notations. Oops, oh, sorry. Okay. So uh, here you see the notations, uh, spring flowers, uh, I, I circle them, spring flowers, summer flowers and autumn flowers. Uh, leveling some of the flower arrangements suggests that Bunami considered particular seasons in parts of this display. A notion that would later become particularly important in Toriyawase. In early 16th century though, a drastic shift in setting and the way of making and drinking tea uh, occurred. It was during an intense civil war between warlords and political factions when a culture of self-reflectiveness was emerging. This sentiment contributed to the development of the wabi aesthetic or uh, taste for plain and unpolished beauty, the guiding principle of chanoyu that we know now. A new style of tea called a uh, tea room called soan um, or mountain village hut became popular among Kyoto's wealthy residents. A soan was a smaller independent tea room with a built-in sunken hearth around which the host entertained and made and served tea to a small number of guests. It is said that Sen no Rikyu, a tea practitioner and wealthy merchant who is considered as the founder of Chanoyu, created one and a half tatami mat room. This tayan, uh, we already is, <clears throat> I already show you the slide, but here um, the, the same tayan. Uh, only remaining tea house uh, designed by Rikyu has three tatami mats, which is less than 4.6 square me meters. Importantly, this new wabi aesthetic was more than a preference for crudeness, imperfection, and simplicity over elegance and perfection. Contri contrivance and the discrimination of objects were integral to wabi, as exemplified by the Soan tea room you can see how artificial it was to create a small village hut in a busy city like Kyoto. So this was reflected in the contradictory way of mixing Chinese made objects 
with Japanese and Korean made objects of wabi taste in toriyawase. We have a record of a toriyawase Senoriku created for tea gathering with a fellow merchant named Kamiya Sotan in 1587. Its small tea room had just three tatami mats, like the tayan in this image. In its alcove, we paired a cylindrical Korean vase holding a white plum blossom with a large Chinese jar named Hashidate, one of Rikyu's prized possessions. Rikyu used another Chinese object, a bulbous shaped tea caddy alongside a rustic Ido Chawan tea bowl from Korea. The Korean tea bowl was probably something like this tea bowl in uh, the University of Michigan Museum of Arts collection. Notably, WQ selected two Korean objects that could allude to Sotan's connection to trade with Korea. As WQ was incredibly busy, he held a gathering past midnight in darkness. Thus, a white plum blossom was appropriate since it was visible even in dim candlelight. Sota must have enjoyed viewing the flower in this way, appreciating, it, appreciating its sense of nobility and fragrance. After more than a century of civil unrest, Tokugawa Ieyasu established the Tokugawa Shogunate in Edo, uh, which is modern day Tokyo. And he and his successors made the political and socio-economical foundations of a relatively peaceful next 250 years. In the 17th century, the style of Chanoyu, perfected by Senorikyu, became ever more popular among military elites, aristocrats, and merchants. The mixed use of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and objects of other origins continued. But as the population of Chanoyu practitioners widened, demands for tea utensils became greater, stimulating production of large quantities of Chinese objects of Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese objects of Chinese taste. One of the trendsetters and important practitioners of the time was Kobori Enshu. His style of tea was called Kirei Sabi, or elegant rusticity. You can see it very clearly in this interior view of the Katsura detached palace in Kyoto. It's a residence for Prince Toshihito, who was esteemed as a person of culture and Enshu's good friend. Enshu oversaw the designs of the building and the garden of the palace. From the combination of the simple rustic walls and columns, um, and colorful modern looking checkerboard pattern side sliding doors, you can see a very different wabi style from Rikyu's. So um, this uh, detached palace uh, Katsura, in Katsura uh, is uh, one of the uh, most beautiful buildings in Kyoto. Well, there are many beautiful things in Kyoto. So I hope when the travel is possible again, I hope some of you will visit there. Okay, so let's look at this story I was so I uh, created this Toriyawase from the teaware collection of the University of Michigan Museum of Art for the wonderful exhibition of tea bowls uh, called Path of the Tea Bowl at the Alfred Ceramic Art Museums of the Alfred, Alfred University in New York. The exhibition is created by ceramic historian, Dr. Megan Jones and is ongoing until March 27th. It reflects the taste of toriyawase preferred by someone like Kobori Enshu. A red raku ware tea bowl by Raku Tanyu is paired with the blue and white porcelain water jar, a black lacquer tea container with a sprinkled gold, gold dust and a bamboo scoop. On the alcove, there's a calligraphy. Oops, next slide. Okay, okay so on the alcove, there's a calligraphy scroll by Toda Jitsuzan, the head priest of Daiji in a sub temple of the Zen Buddhist temple complex, Daitokuji in Kyoto. A tenmoku, so called crane neck flower vase uh, on the right side, and an ash glazed shigaraki ware incense container on the left. 
So um, the perfectly shaped, elegantly decorated Hirado ware porcelain, uh, the water jar, and the Temok flower vase, both representing Chinese taste, although they are you know, made in Japan. Um, they contrast strikingly with the thickly constructed, uneven rockware tea bowl and shigaraki incense container. Although there is a variety of styles, shapes, and tastes, <clears throat> the ensemble connotes an overarching theme of everlasting friendship to celebrate a partnership between the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum and the University of Michigan Museum of Art. The calligraphy reads, evergreen for ages. The Chinese symbols of three friends of winter, pine, <clears throat> bamboo, and plum, are represented uh, in the pressed uh, in three objects here. Uh, one is the pressed pattern of pine leaves of the tea bowl, rakuware tea bowl, the tea container named bamboo grove, uh, and plum flower shaped incense container. Furthermore, the water jar has the motifs of six Chinese sages engaging in scholarly pursuits get together. As seen in the story of Ase, the mixture of different styles and makers, so here uh, no single makers are the same, uh, uh, it's, it's preferred and the surprising way of matching objects of uh, different tastes is where the host knowledge and creativity are best tested. This preference for diverse styles and origins is a, a distinctive characteristic of Chanoyu as established by Sen Rikyu and refined by Kobori Enshu and other Edo period practitioners. <clears throat> so in the middle of the 19th century, Japan went through a drastic political and social change and the practice of chanoyu uh, was no exception. As it had always been a manly pursuit, chanoyu largely excluded women from the practice. As the Meiji government pursued strengthening military and economic powers, women were given new roles to be part of the national project. Raising children who would become future imperial subjects and managing household as uh, quote unquote, good wives and wise mothers. <clears throat> Chanoyu was considered a great way to teach them proper Japanese manners and home management, as well as to furnish them with the knowledge of arts and crafts necessary for middle and upper class life. In the 20th century, especially after World War II, the female population of Chanoyu practitioners expanded rapidly. The taste of population, um, oh, the taste of toriawase largely followed that of the Edo period. <clears throat> However, there was one significant change as women came to dominate the practice. Chanoyu attire became a part of creating a special occasion. Unlike men's kimono and obi, which are mostly in subdued dark colors and understated patterns. Um, you see on the left side, and uh, sort of a contrast between uh, men's kimono and women's kimono. Um, so women's attire is typical in various colors, patterns, and motifs. Women channel practitioners would carefully consider season, location, occasion, and guests when selecting their attire, just like the tea utensils used in the tea room. So uh, I just uh, put the example from uh, our collection, uh, from one of kimonos, and uh, um, so it has a wisteria flowers. And so this kind of kimono would be appro appropriate for uh, early summer season when wisteria flowers are in bloom. So, um, Here I want to introduce Chanoyu related ceramics from the Gardner Museum's McDonald uh, collection. The collection has several great examples of small plate used for chakaiseki called mukozuke. Chakaiseki is a specially prepared food for tea gatherings. The food is very important part of creating special moment for the guest 
and the menu and the utensils would follow an overall concept and theme of the particular gathering. So um, oftentimes you see a tea demonstration um, outside of Japan, uh, you see only just a, you know, a small part of it. So the full-fledged um, tea gathering uh, usually takes up to four hours or even more. Uh, and uh, so the meal, um, takaiseki, is uh, part of that too. So this dish of pomegranate and peach form is one of the place for chakaiseki. Pomegranate and peach are auspicious fruits symbolizing frequent, uh, uh, symbolizing fecundity because there are, so, uh, there are many seas and also longevity. Um, the queen of the uh, queen mother of the West of the uh, lands of Immortals holds a peach on her hand. So this plate uh, can be used for spring and summer or it could be a birthday of a guest wishing for their long life. And this plate was made in China uh, for Japanese market in early part of 17th century. So here's an example of a small dish uh, with food. Um, they're usually used to serve uh, sas sashimi, uh, raw fish slices. So chakaiseki involves many different dishes, and this one uh, is uh, mukozuke. Uh, it's uh, put on a tray along the rice and soup bowls, so it has to be a rather small size. So I'm going to show you a few more examples from the uh, McDonald collection. So here's one uh, with the uh, stacked uh, jars. Uh, it's really wonderful design and surprising design too. Um, here's another one, uh, this one with the uh, shape of, uh, with the decoration of maple leaf and two birds. And my interpretation here is uh, it's actually a lake and uh, it's autumn season and the red leaf is floating um, on the lake. And there's also a reflection of two birds uh, flying over the lake. Uh, here's another one, uh, it's a leaf uh, form dish with the uh, blue and white and uh, uh, overglaze uh, enamel uh, decoration. So um, just going back to this, uh, so you can see that these plates are about 14 to 17 centimeter long, so they're all rather small. So this covered box in the shape of a bird was probably for uh, export, but for the small size and the form with the cover, it can be used as kogo or incense container, which is usually displayed in the alcove. Um, and here's a tiger-shaped incense container, you, um, the, the picture you saw uh, you sh already. Um, it's really, usually these you know, kogo are very small and uh, really nice sort of a collectible items. So, um, Although it is a bit of off topic, um, there are also several objects in the uh, McDonald collection, which were not intended, but can be used for Chanoyu. To borrow something from totally different original uh, usages or context is called mitate in Japanese culture, meaning uh, borrow and represent. So you can see mitate uh, in literature, visual arts, uh, performing arts, and uh, also in Chanoyu. This small beaker from Worcester porcelain manufactory has motifs of beautiful plum-like flowers and quails. This size of cylinder-shaped container is perfect to be used as a tea container if we simply add a wooden lid. In East Asia, plums are thought to bloom first thing in the spring. Uh, this beaker is perfect for mid-February tea gathering, just like now. Also, a pair of birds means happy marriage. So uh, we could use this to celebrate wedding anniversary for a couple. In fact, the original purpose of chaire or ceramic, ceramic tea containers is said to be a medicine container in China in the 12th century. So uh, it was a uh, mitate originally. 
So here's an image I recently saw on Instagram. This tea practitioner in France used the blue and white French tobacco jar as mizusashi or water jar. The lid was added later. Like Toriawase, a clever mitate can be a place to show the host's creativity and wonderful surprise for the guest, which will trigger uh, a further conversation. So uh, this uh, photo leads to the, uh, my last topic, uh, which is uh, Toriawase in contemporary time, uh, especially of the two, past two years. So has the practice of Toriawase changed? I would say many practitioners find toriyawase a rich field of personal expression, and toriyawase became ever more important space to con convey one's idea and feeling. As I have indicated, Chanoyu and its particular toriyawase is performed and experienced in relation to a space, time, and human relation between the host and the guests. So how can they become meaningful when many of these relations, relations are denied. During the global pandemic and forced lockdowns of 2020 and 21, making and drinking tea became a place of solace for many people, including myself, and a bowl of tea emerged as a symbol of kindness, compassion, empathy, and humanity. Holding a tea bowl with two hands and feel the warmth of tea not to mention the calming effect of drinking tea, many people developed special attachment to the tea bowl when they were forced to recoil from touching. Many students of Chanoyu were forced to practice on their own during the pandemic. Some reached out to their teachers and fellow students over video conferencing tools. Others thought bigger and connected with other students from all over the world using social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. The Urasenke School of Tea Association in Quebec started a simple event of offering tea to other fellow students in their circle using Facebook in August 2020. The event called Urasenke World Chado Relay quickly grew and crossed the Canadian borders into the United States, then to Mexico, South America, to Western and Eastern Europe, Egypt, Southeast Asia, Australia, China, Korea, and then reached to Japan in April 2021. Although the relay became more like an introduction of each local association and the past activities, Individual members also posted a photo of tea in a tea bowl as if offering it to the person on the other side. Many of these photos were taken outside, in some cases at breathtaking sites of natural landscape. So when physical travel was severely limited, these individuals were providing pictures of these locations for the guests. Here the tea bowl is presented oftentimes without other utensils. Um, these can be said at Toriawase of the pandemic and lockdown era. A similar thread of Chanoyu offering a bowl of tea virtually titled hashtag Ippuku Challenge Ochawan Baton or hand, Handing Baton for One Tea, One Tea Bowl Challenge is currently happening on Instagram. The future grandmaster of Mushano Koji Senke School, Sensuoku, initiated two rounds of the threads since the pandemic started in the spring 2020. And this is the third, third round, which started in January 2022, so just last month. Under the rule, uh, rules, he says, uh, one, uh, pick, a, pick a table that is special to you and that you have a strong emotional attachment. For the first photo, show the entire table in the second photo, show the same table with tea, which was just made. If you want to show other parts of the tea bowl, such as the bottom or sweets to go with the tea, feel free to post more photos. Uh, number three, uh, nominate at least one person for next participants using their account names. 
Number four, if you receive nomination again, please, please use a different table. Like in person channel you, each participant or the host would write, sometimes in great lengths, about how this particular ball is meaningful to them. A table in one post by uh, Sensouoku himself was related to art dealer Yanagi Koichi, who was active in New York and Kyoto and helped many museums and collectors in North America to acquire quality Japanese works of art. He um, unexpectedly passed away last month. The black deep tea ball called Tsujawan by Tsujimura Shiro was a gift from Mr. Yanagi. Uh, in the post, Mr. Sen talks about Yanagi's memories and how helpful he was when Mr. Sen stayed in New York for a year in 2008. He wrote, quote, I have no words facing such a sudden farewell. I feel totally helpless when I consider what a big loss that is for the field of Japanese art. I remember how Mr. Yanagi was gentle always humble and kind. I made tea using this tea bowl that Mr. Yanagi was fond of and gave to me, showing my gratitude, dedicating to him and drinking together with his soul. Please rest in peace, Mr. Yanagi, end quote. Um, looking and reading Mr. Sen's post, it was a moment for me to reflect on Mr. Yanagi too, who was very kind while I was visiting his uh, New York gallery. In Chanoyu, there's a special type of gathering in memory of someone deceased. The most famous one is for the founder of Chanoyu, Sen Rikyu, which is on March 27th. Um, he died, by the way, on the lunar calendar of February 28th, um, 1591. Chanoyu practitioners would host a tea gathering on that day or around that day, reflecting on Rikyu's teachings, creating toriyawase of tea utensils which associate, associate with uh, Rikyu. Mr. Sen's post was following this tradition. And in fact, it is indeed very special under this circumstance that we are restricted from hosting large in-person gatherings a gathering in Mr. Yanagi's memory was uh, probably impossible. While more people gradually returned to in-person practice in year 2022, these human connections in virtual realm uh, remain very strong. So in conclusion, I hope that my talk uh, has shown that Atoriyawase is an important part of Chanoyu creating a special and unique moment for the guests and um, the host. It touches on the fundamental idea behind Chanoyu, uh, which is a dedicate all your effort to serve to others. Like many creative activities, Toriyawase is where practitioners' knowledges, experiences, and creativity are um, tested. As a novice Chanoyu practitioner myself, I enjoy the process of thinking creatively, creatively about toriyawase for a gathering or even for a quick afternoon tea of my own. On this cold day of February, I would select a tea bowl which has a motif of plum blossoms paired with the bamboo tea scoop named Kokoro no Tomo, or friend of my heart. Wishing for arrival of spring and remembering a fun memory of outside stroll with my old friend. Although uh, I cannot serve the tea uh, to this friend who is in Japan, I can always send a photo of the Toriyawase to her and we will share the moment despite the physical distance. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Natsuo Yobe, for this fascinating lecture, which shows great continuity between past um, and present. Um, I'm going to start looking at the question uh, that we received. So please, if you have a, if you have a question and, and you, you haven't submitted it yet, please 
uh, enter it in the Q&A function. So um, we have one question here, which says, first of all, thank you for this beautiful presentation. Could you talk a bit more about the manner in which a set of ceramic dishes, mukozuke, is distributed among trays for guests in the chakaiseki? Is it different from the way that matching sets of dishes are used in Western cultures? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, so um, as I you know, talked in this uh, presentation that the idea, very important thing about toriyawase is to um, bring different kind of you know, uh, objects, styles uh, from different origins. So um, even within the, um, the uh, meal, uh, they use you know, all sorts of different uh, dishes. So it's, it's a very different concept. Uh, however, uh, if there are more, um, more than one guest, so you know, three or four guests, um, you see that the same mukozuke in each you know, uh, guest. So um, the, if you're you know, tea production, you might own not only you know, one mukozuke, but uh, uh, four or five uh, mukozuke of the same style. Thank you. Um, our next question, once more, uh, congratulates you on this fascinating and beautiful presentation and uh, the introduction of the virtual channel U activities during the pandemic, which I um, also thought was uh, very interesting. Um, so the, the comment in question um, says, although some museums have tried to display more works and ensembles, uh, for example, the Buddhist altar at the UMMA, the Peacock Room at the Freer Gallery, I think that in general, most museums are set up to feature a single works or a small number of works in vitrines. How do you feel about spaces in museums, such as the old tea room at the UMMA, um, in which objects can be displayed in more traditional contexts, often with mul multiple disparate works juxtaposed? And also, what are some of the institutional limitations on more culturally specific um, uh, display practices, such as the Toria was so it's a big question. Yeah, that's a big question. But thank you. Thank you. That's a great, great question. And uh, we curators always struggle <laughs> with the question, uh, with, with the, you know, uh, the limitation of the space. Uh, and there's also, you know, tendency, I guess, in uh, general, general tendency in art museums that we want to focus like, you know, masterpieces. Um, and rather than showing you know, multiple pieces together, although you know, some uh, museums uh, try to do differently, uh, that's still kind of a, a regular practice I see. Um, in uh, several like tea, um, tea wear exhibitions, I have seen that, so while uh, showing these sort of masterpieces, but at the same time, there's a section that show or how these tea wares, wares were presented in original context, like you know, tea room. So uh, there's that kind of effort. So if you have uh, enough space, uh, I think, and, and you know, dedicated to one thing, like tea, you know, channel your tea ceremony, that's uh, possible. Um, I don't know if I miss anything else. Uh, that was a long question, so. Yes, um, I think you addressed the question. And um, as you mentioned, sometimes it's also a question of space limitations and what we can do with how our, our display spaces are configured. Um, there was also a follow up question uh, from this um, same attendee. Um, in studying and exhibiting tea wares, have you encountered challenges, challenges related to biases against objects mm -hmm. categorized as, as folk crafts, so Minjay, min as opposed to decorative arts? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's it's a yeah a challenge also. Yeah, um, I think in general we um, if you're working at the um, uh, encyclopedic museum, I guess the tendency again is to focus on like paintings, uh, sculptures, uh, those uh, category categories which were you know um, uh, like categorized as fine arts. Um, so, and, but, um, you know, it's a big question, but uh, uh, in uh, East Asia, uh, actually the, you know, there's not that clear distinction. So, uh, and the, actually tea is um, really interesting um, sort of practice that show, I mean, that kind of, you know, uh, it's a, a convenient way of showing that, uh, you know, all different kind of artworks um, from different categories all together 
in um, a room, in a single room. So I think there's a great potential uh, to introduce these, you know, tea spaces uh, in museum and present that, you know, there are other ways of looking um, um, artworks, just, you know, free, you know, from these kind of uh, Western categories. But thank you for a great question. Yes, I think that your presentation really showed how the objects interacted with one another, breaking those divisions and boundaries between different types of artworks. So I think um, you've, um, you, you've proven to us the importance of looking at these objects um, in relation to one another. Um, our following uh, question, can you provide other examples of the of foods uh, which were offered during the tea ceremony? So we've seen a sashimi, what else? Mm -hmm. would be yeah, sashimi, so what else? So uh, if on the same tray, the black, usually black tray, you see a little bit of a rice, um, mm -hmm. cooked rice and the uh, uh, miso soup. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the beginning. And then uh, the host and the host assistant will bring um, cooked, uh, like, you know, uh, grilled fish, um, some vegetables, I guess three or four different kinds of vegetables. Um, as far as I know, I guess um, maybe no meat is used, uh, usually fish and vegetables. Um, and what else? Oh, um, so at the end of the meal, oh, I have to say that the important thing is that you also drink sake, rice wine with these uh, dishes. So uh, this, you know, uh, consuming meal per pot would take at least one hour. It's just, you know, takes long time, lots of, you know, conversations. And then uh, at the end, uh, you would um, be served with the uh, um, sweets. Um, you know, uh, you might notice that in the picture of these, you know, different uh, plates, uh, there was a sweet. And then you have to leave the room and the uh, uh, host will change the, uh, um, the display of uh, tokonoma and, you know, and then uh, the um, guests were uh, invited again to the room and served with tea. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of a quick, uh, you know, um, description, but uh, um, if you're more interested, there are, you know, lots of uh, books. And also I, I think uh, you can find videos uh, these days. Uh, on YouTube, so to uh, show this really long process. So, yes, yeah. well, it certainly sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you mentioned in your lecture at what moment of the day uh, the yeah. would be starting and ending. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it depends. Uh, sometimes these uh, gathering will start very early in the morning, especially summertime before the sun, you know, rise, I mean, even before sun rises, because it gets really hot. And, um, but in other times, like uh, in December, uh, there's um, these tea gathering might start like four or 5 p.m. Uh, then they kind of enjoy the darkness. Uh, and um, so there's a, um, that's uh, called a yobanashi or a conversation at night, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this uh, special, uh, type of um, tea gathering. But I guess usually uh, it starts like late morning and goes uh, the entire like uh, uh, afternoon. That's, um, that certainly involves a lot of planning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Preparation. Um, so our next um, question, um, I was very struck by how modern some of the McDonald collection ceramics that you presented, for instance, the pomegranate and peach dish, uh, from China that you showed. Um, you mentioned that, they, that, they, that these were made in China. Uh, were they mass produced? And what does mass produce uh, mean for the 16th century? Mm. Yeah, are they mass produced? Um, well, um, I think not like the sense of, you know, our sort of our sense of mass produced. Mm. Uh, usually those are uh, kind of made to order. So, um, and I don't really know, really know uh, probably there are more specialists uh, in this group that, uh, um, but um, I think, I mean, that usually these tea uh, practitioners back then were really, um, you know, being invited or invite guests. So they know uh, each other and they kind of, the influence of, you know, one important practitioner would 
transmit to another quite uh, rapidly. So uh, it's possible that they, if they see you know certain objects and they want to have a similar one, they can you know order. Um, and I don't know if that really becomes kind of mass produced, but um, it's not. I have to say it's not one of kind, and many objects are not one of kind. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that tea practitioners were able to order um, uh, these sets of fruit shape or mm -hmm. um, we also have a fish in the McDonald's collection, like order them directly from the uh, factories in Jingdezhen? Was there like this network of communication that was? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. there's a, of yeah. course merchants, I mean, that they're, yeah. people, you know, uh, go-betweens, but mm -hmm. the, yes, it's, it's quite possible, yes. Um, um, Again, our next um, uh, attendee is saying thank you uh, once more for the wonderful presentation. Um, may I ask when the concept of Toria was a first became discussed among tea practitioners? Mm -hmm. Did we see the idea mentioned at the time of, of Rikyu or did it perhaps become more salient during the time of Enshu? Thank you for your thoughts on, on this. Yeah. Um, you know, there are many uh, famous um, so-called tea diaries um, that was already you see at, around the Wikius time. So um, the, and and some of the in some of these tea diaries, um, well, uh, one very important sort of a uh, uh, thing that they always write is Toriyawase. So what kind of objects they saw in these you know um, tea gathering. So although that. That term Toriyawase, I don't know if it's already born, it was already born that time, coined by that time, but there's a, that concept already there that uh, you were impressed with this kind of you know, arrangements and you take notes and you want to sort of uh, um, copy or you know, imitate. Um, yeah, they, they do that kind of thing. Um, the you, you've talked about the more like formalized way of consuming tea were there um like how was uh, tea consumed informally in the 17th century what kind of objects uh, would be used on a day-to-day -day basis outside of a ceremony um that's an interesting question um I I would think that they're I mean they just use uh, the same just the same I mean tea <laughs> bowl <laughs> the whisk <laughs> but not like you know the full fresh like you know arrangement toriyawase yeah okay but the objects used in that toriyawase wouldn't be restricted to this context oh, no, no, no. they could be so. used at another mm -hmm. moment during the day um, yeah yeah oh, interesting mm -hmm. um. Another question, is Buddhism ideology still extremely crucial to the tea ceremony, or is the idea of wabi more vital now? Sometimes the Buddhism doctrine can deny or contradict the concept of wabi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, um, yeah, th there are uh, lots of discussions about trying to see um, the religious, I mean, the Buddhist aspects within uh, tea. Uh, but I have to say that uh, the idea behind wabi is uh, really uh, non-religious. It's it's my take. Um, but uh, uh, the the formality of like you know prescribed movement, you see great influence from Zen Buddhism. Uh, or some people say that uh, there's a element of Christianity. So. Um, end of you know 16th century, there was uh, uh, there were you know Christian missionaries in Japan, and uh, uh, the way that when you uh, drink tea, you kind of raise the you know bowl uh, to to really appreciate. But the gesture, the movement um, looks like you know like what you see in uh, Christian you know uh, ceremony. So yeah, um, there are actually lots of sort of elements. Uh, went into tea. And I don't know if I have said <laughs> that question, but yeah. Yes, well, those are fascinating connections. So there are like so many uh, traditions that are informing mm -hmm. uh, the channel use. So this is really um, a fascinating topic. Um, so 
We've reached the end of our program. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today and for your very thoughtful and very informed questions. And also thank you so much uh, to Dr. Natsuo Yobe for this fascinating uh, lecture, which I really enjoyed. And it's gonna bring me to look at, our, at some objects in our collection in a different way. Um, so thank you to everyone for being with us today. Um, we have a slide here which advertises our next virtual lecture, which will be taking place on April 5th at the same time at one o'clock. Uh, the talk is entitled Race and Ornament, Seeing, Seeing the Black Body in 18th Century Porcelain, and it will be delivered by uh, Dr. Adrian Childs. You can visit the Gardner Museum's website uh, for more information about the talk and for registration information. So um, thank you again, Dr. Uh, Oyobe, and um, I wish everyone a very wonderful afternoon. Goodbye.